this is Lisa from Mobile Tech Review, and this is the Samsung Galaxy Nexus on Verizon. Finally, December 15, 2011, the phone has arrived, and we're going to take a look at it now. So this is the Samsung Galaxy Nexus on Verizon. This is the LTE version, and it's a little bit thicker, but still a pretty slim phone. It's got that Nexus S kind of curve that I really like. It's got the contour curved glass here, and a little bit of a chin. But it only weighs 5.1 ounces, so it's a fairly light phone. What it gets in the process is LTE 4G on Verizon's network, and also it has 32 gigs of internal storage versus 16 for the imported GSM HSPA Plus version. The phone is available now for $299 with contract on Verizon Wireless in the U.S., and it's the first phone to run Ice Cream Sandwich, which is Android OS 4.0. And what's so cool about that? Well, everybody likes a new version of an operating system, but there are actually some improvements here and some things that are going to help the ecosystem. It's basically a marriage of honeycomb and gingerbread operating systems. We'll see some things that are similar here. For example, there's no hardware buttons anymore. Everything is on screen, just like with honeycomb. And you've got the really neat application switcher here. It shows you everything that's running. You can jump between those or everything that I have run. Some of these things do eventually get suspended to manage memory. And to get to your applications, you just tap there. And you can see the phone is very, very fast. And we can switch between apps and widgets here with Ice Cream Sandwich. Super fast phone. Why is that? Well, other than the fact that this is running on a 1.2 GHz dual-core TI processor, which seems to be Google's darling right now for all things Ice Cream Sandwich, it's running a pure Google operating system. There's no overlays here, there's no customizations, there's no HTC Sense or Samsung TouchWiz or any of those things, so it's pretty much running as clean and as lightweight as it can. Is it a fast phone? Yeah, it's one of the fastest Android phones I've ever used, and the word lag really doesn't come to mind whenever I use this. You've got your launcher dock right here, pre-populated with phone, we've got the web browser, we've got messaging, that kind of thing. And if you want to see the widgets that are available, we'll take a look here. I've only got a few running. I've got an analog clock, which disappears on this wallpaper. By the way, the wallpapers that come with this are as deadly dull as ever on vanilla Android devices. I don't know, Google just really needs to hire a graphic artist because they're just not very exciting. But you can load your own wallpaper and, and spiff this guy up. So as we take a look at the widget options over here, you can see analog clock, bookmarks, Google Books. A lot of these are carryovers from previous versions of... Android, calendar widgets, contacts widgets, direct dial, all that kind of stuff, your Gmail, your email, Google Maps widget, Google Plus. This is big on Google Plus integration, Google social networking, and it's got the Google Plus application, obviously, the widgets and Hangouts, everything you can want for that. Shortcut to the market, media player controls, photo gallery, the wireless controls right here, and a shortcut to settings, and then the YouTube widget. So. That's your basic standard Google set of widgets, no customizations again. Now, since this phone is on Verizon, it gets just a couple of apps from Verizon. We've got My Verizon Mobile to manage your account right here, and we have Verizon's Backup Assistant. That's it. There's not even VZ Navigator preloaded on here, nothing. And if we take a look at settings, this is the new ice cream sandwich version of settings that breaks things up into categories, by the way. You can see that NFC is indeed enabled on the phone, and there were some rumors about Verizon killing NFC. You can't download Google Wallet for this from the market, but then again, we haven't been able to do that in Galaxy S2s with uh, NFC built in and such. We've got Android Beam, and that's to connect to other Android phones that have NFC. We've also got the tethering portable hotspot feature, which is great because this phone has LTE on it, and it's Certainly a fast mobile hotspot for your tablet or your laptop. And we've got Wi-Fi Direct as well, and VPN access. While we're looking at settings, since the, the Nexus line historically has been for developers, now not so much, obviously it's also for consumers, but we've got developer options here, all sorts of stuff. USB debugging and stay awake are not so surprising, but we've got strict mode for UI, pointer locations, you've even got Show CPU, CPU usage as an overlay on top of your apps. Force GPU rendering. All sorts of really geeky things for those of you who are developers or who are into more arcane settings on your phone. Backup and reset has now become option to backup my data first, and then you can factory 
reset the phone if you want. Other than that, it won't be too unfamiliar to those of you by any means who are used to gingerbread phones or even honeycomb tablets. Go back to the desktop here, and if there's something on your desktop you don't want, just drag it and remove it pretty much like honeycomb. If there's an application you don't want anymore, other than the ones that are built into ROM, for example, Google Books, can't do anything with that except for put it on, make it a shortcut, or get information on it, but say I don't want the Antutu benchmark application anymore, one of my options here is uninstall. The Galaxy Nexus has a gig of RAM, it has Wi-Fi 802.11bgn, Bluetooth 3.0, a GPS, a 1.3 megapixel front video chat camera that works with Skype and Google Talk, and we tested with Skype, it works very nicely, and on the back here, you've got a 5 megapixel camera that can shoot 1080p video. Now, 5 megapixels isn't that exciting in terms of resolution, but it's an extremely fast camera, and Google is proud of it. They've been showing that often. It takes nice panorama shots, and we'll look at that in a bit. As we take a look around the phone, we can see, well, it looks very Galaxy S2 family-ish, doesn't it? You've got the hard plastic around the edges, the little bulging chin, this interesting and, once again, very, very thin plastic back on the phone. And to take that off, just grab and rip. There's the 1850 milliamp battery, and this is your micro SIM card slot. Verizon's moving to micro SIMs. Even the Motorola Zyboard tablets use micro SIMs now. And the SIM card is used for LTE, but also for the phone's identity, much as that works with GSM phones. You still have 1X in here and CDMA, EVDO, Rev A for data, but if you take this SIM card out and you put it in another micro SIM compatible phone on Verizon, your phone number and your account information follow you. So it's pretty handy. No more dialing star 228. In fact, with LTE phones, they say you should never do that. Just take this SIM out and put it in your next Verizon LTE phone or vice versa. Take it from another phone put it in this, and you're good to go. Your phone number follows you, your account, all that stuff. So we continue taking a look around the phone. This is your dock connector over here for optional accessory dock. That's the power button, typical of Samsung. They always put it there. Nothing up top. And over here we have the volume rocker, which is almost directly across from the power button, so you get that typical problem with Samsung. If you squeeze the phone, you're going to hit one or the other or both when you didn't mean to. This, by the way, it sticks out of a reasonable amount, and I find it very easy to press. I'm constantly picking up the phone and holding onto it and accidentally muting it, so watch out for that. Bottom here, here's your micro USB connector, for data transfer, your microphone hole, and your 3.5 millimeter headphone jack. And that's your speaker grill right there. Your minimalist dialer screen here. Now this is a 4.65 inch Super AMOLED display running at 720p. That means 1280 pixels by 720 pixels. So it's a large screen, but the phone isn't super huge either. Here it is compared to the Samsung Galaxy S2 Skyrocket on AT&T, one of AT&T's LTE phones, and that's a 4.5 inch phone, so you can see the, the size-wise, they're, they're pretty close actually. Call quality on the Verizon Galaxy Nexus is superb. Really, it's about the best I have ever heard on Verizon. Nice, full, clear audio. Every bit as good as the Galaxy S2 Skyrocket on AT&T. And here in the West, we tend to get better voice quality and reception, uh, at least in our area of Dallas, versus, on AT&T versus Verizon. But in this case, indistinguishably excellent. Call volume is pretty good as well. And speakerphone's not bad. It's, it's not definitely loud. It's adequate unless you're in a super noisy location, in which case you're going to want to use a headset. A stereo wired earbud headset is included with the phone made by Samsung. Of course, you can use Bluetooth headsets and car kits and all that kind of stuff with this, too. Data speeds, rocking. Now, you can see here in our offices, we, we have just one itsy little bar LTE. Right now, we have probably a 100 dB signal. Not so good. But we drove around the Dallas area so we could see some better speeds. And you can see up top with about a 76 to 84 dB signal, we got some phenomenal speeds. 20 megabit down, 33 here, almost 20, 28. And upload speed 16.8 almost, 15, 16. And then here in our offices, where we barely have any signal, we still got a pretty respectable speeds for download, at least. We got 10.9 and 12.7. Upload speeds really did start to suffer some of the time, but we got 2.7 there, and then sadly under 1 megabit once. But again, that's with almost no LTE signal whatsoever. 
The phone behaves pretty well. Speaking of, of poor signal area, my Droid Bionic used to thrash back and forth between LTE and 3G EVDO all day long, killing the battery. And This guy manages to be stable. If it gets that one bar of LTE, it really manages to lock onto it most of the time, so I'm not seeing that problem with signal waffling back and forth and resulting battery drain. That said, LTE is a big consumer of power, and this is a big display phone, so battery life on this is you're definitely going to want to charge it every night. In terms of speed, you, you know I already feel like this phone is very responsive experientially. For synthetic benchmarks on, on Tutu Benchmark, it did 59.85, which is respectable, puts it among the top phones and tablets. Quadrant really clearly doesn't understand how to run under ice cream sandwich, because it's got a 14.79, which just isn't right. There's that. No. And on the SunSpider JavaScript test, it did 2175, which puts it again near, near the top with the fastest phones and tablets. And you can see our result right here. And you can see speed of zooming and scrolling around. Obviously, this is a pretty lightweight page, so we'll check out our own page, which is a non-mobile site. And you can see the on-screen keyboard here. This is, again, the stock Google keyboard. It's, the size is not too bad landscape mode. In portrait mode, it's pretty darn teeny. It's like... Uh, I'm not really sure why the keys need to be quite that small. It's a big phone, but I feel like I'm a little bit cramped when I'm typing. So here we've got the Android WebKit browser loader. You can see how the UI has changed from gingerbread and even from honeycomb. We have our soft keys here now on the side because we're in landscape mode. You've got access to your tabs over here, which we have none right now. And this is how you get to your settings menu here. This is pretty pervasive throughout the operating system now. It's not like Honeycomb where your settings can be in two different places, which seem to confuse people, or your menu access. So you have right here, request desktop site. That's pretty nice, because you buy your high-end phone and you don't really want to see the WAP version of New York Times. So you, it's now as easy as that. No more putting about colon debug in the URL bar to, to force developer settings and all that. So good stuff. Colors and contrast, always excellent with Super AMOLED. No, it's not Super AMOLED Plus, so it is pentile, but I am not seeing a whole lot of color shift. Pretty good viewing angles, none of that tinged with green. It's plenty nice enough. And, and again, really, really fast pinch zooming. Adobe Flash? No, not now, sorry. Adobe has said, even though they're killing off mobile Flash development, that they're going to continue to do maintenance releases, and they will release a version of Flash Player for Ice Cream Sandwich by the end of this year, which leaves them about two weeks to get that done, folks. But they say it is coming, so that's nice, because right now we still need Adobe Flash to, to view the web. We've got, also got folders now in Ice Cream Sandwich, and you see this little Google icon on here. It looks sort of like Google Maps. Well, it's actually a folder with all Google applications put in one place, which is pretty handy. GPS works well on this, and you've got your standard Android market that hasn't changed. In fact, the music app looks pretty much the same as well, and Gallery is fairly similar. Google Books is pretty low to Google Talk, YouTube Player, Navigation, Google+. We've also got Movie Studio here, which migrated over from Honeycomb, kind of neat. And we've got the Music Player, which again looks a whole lot like the Music Player that we saw under Gingerbread. And here's the music player, which is largely unchanged from, from Gingerbread and from Honeycomb. And right now I have a filter to just show stuff that I have stored locally, but this works with their cloud service, and we can just turn on that. And wow, suddenly I have a whole lot more music. Scrolling through with pretty album covers and all that kind of thing. So now we're streaming something right now over Verizon's LTE network with that one teeny little bar, and it's still managing just fine. Uh, this right now is the loudest volume setting. This is not a super-duper loud speaker. The audio quality, however, is nice. It's a reasonable bass for a phone speaker, and it sounds pleasing. And yes, it can run in the background while you do other things, if you want to listen to music. And now we're in the gallery application. We're going to play a 1080p high-profile video, which will be no problem for the phone. Smooth, nice, beautiful screen for video playback. And this is an MHL compatible connector down here, so if you have one of those little $20 MHL adapters, you can plug this into your HD TV or your HD monitor to watch content there. And we'll show you that now. We'll plug it into our HD TV. And now we've got the Galaxy Nexus plugged into our MHL adapter, this little dongle over here, which also you plug in your power, your phone's charger into that. Standard HDMI cable. 
You're trying to control things that are not meant Audio to video be controlled. Out to the TV. And this will also mirror the desktop on the phone. So let's just go home. And there we are. So we can sway through our desktops real quick. Do everything we would normally do with the phone. And while we're here to show you gaming, instead of using the small screen, we're going to do this on the HD TV. Now we tried Asphalt 6 HD, which ran through the whole setup just fine and then crashed when you actually wanted to race. So we're going to switch over to Need for Speed Shift instead. And that's only to remember, if you're an early adopter, ice cream sandwich, not all apps are compatible. Even if they show as available in the market, they may or may not work. test out Netflix and as you can see Netflix runs in portrait mode and the phone does not actually rotate for HDMI out so you're going to be well turning your head sideways and stretching your neck a little bit but once it starts playing it'll switch to landscape mode. Now Netflix's streaming quality isn't super duper high so we're stretching it out here to 46 inches which is a bit much for mobile quality but you get the idea. Works well, just fine. So there it is, Netflix too. Next, let's take a look at a, the camera. Again, five megapixel main camera, but the neat thing is how fast it is, and the fact that it can do pretty good panorama shots. So we've got a couple of things set up here. And it's not compensating super well for incandescent lighting. You can see it's a little bit yellow, but can move our focus point around. That fast. And to access settings, you hit the ellipsis and you can see all your various settings that are available over here. Flash, for example, EV compensation, that kind of thing. Let's say we want to shoot a panorama picture. And we keep moving around. And there we have our widescreen panorama shot. And one of the, the last really cool features of Ice Cream Sandwich is the face lock feature. We turn it on. Looks at my face. And just like that, it unlocks really quick. And in my test so far, face lock has worked well even in low light situations, and I did test it. I gave it to another woman to see if her face could fool it. It didn't. Uh, I'm not sure how actually secure it is. Google does tell you when you set up that using a pin or a pattern unlock is more secure, but it's pretty neat and pretty quick. That's the nice thing about it. You don't turn it on and wait and fuss with it and wiggle your face around like you do with some notebooks that use a facial login. It's really very fast and convenient here. So that's the Samsung Galaxy Nexus on Verizon. It's available now for $2.99 with contract LTE ice cream sandwich goodness. Is this one of the best phones on Verizon Wireless right now? No doubt it is. Now, ice cream sandwich shouldn't be your own only decision point. If, you, if you're looking to always get updates quicker than everybody else, then it really helps to have a Nexus phone because you will get OS updates quickly. But beyond that, in a month or two, the, the HTC Resound, the Droid Razor, they're all going to have ice cream sandwich too. And then you're going to have to look at these phones based on their other merits, hardware, and whether you prefer the clean OS or the embellishments that Motorola or HTC or Samsung adds to other phones. But I would say I think it's going to hold up really well even still. It's just ergonomically, it's a pleasant enough phone to use. The screen is, is very nice. The HD Super AMOLED display is, is lovely, and I'm really not bothered by pin tile grain or green shift or anything like that on it. And it's extremely fast. And so far it's been very stable, more so than my Droid Razor or Droid Bionic with holding onto an LTE signal and not flopping back and forth. The, the one drawback with all Verizon LTE phones you can see right now our battery indicators drop quite a lot just during the period of doing this review. So you might want to pick up a spare 1850 milliamp battery.
But again, that's a problem with all LTE phones on Verizon. I'm Lisa from Mobile Tech Review. Visit our website for the full review, and don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel.